If you have your Bibles, for the next few moments anyways, I'd just like to share a few thoughts from the Word of God. 2 Kings in chapter 8, that familiar passage of Scripture that you're all aware, aware you're all well aware of. Perhaps many of you have memorized it. I'll be reading the first six verses. 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 1. Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son had, he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while, wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to, the, and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and it said, tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, this is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. The Lord cares, doesn't he? This is a passage about the Lord cares. His watch care over us is remarkable. Paul Rendell says this, we as Christians ought to be those who part who are particularly thankful for the Lord's watch care over our lives and through our lives from beginning to end. I'm speaking of the Lord's providentially so ordering things in our lives that it becomes apparent to us that the Lord is working in our is working all things together for our good and for his glory in particular places that he leads us and in the way that he brings to other people's attention the great things he has done for us. And that's evident here in this passage. So that we become witnesses to his love and care for us. And that's evident in this passage. And we see this watch care recounted here in this passage of scripture. It's only six verses, but we learn at least four things about how much the Lord cares for us, at least how he cared for this woman here, the Shunammite woman. And she's referred to as the Shunammite woman. There's no Betty or Joanne or Lorraine or Lurlane. That's all we know. She's the Shunammite woman uh, because she's from Shun. And that's in the northern part of Israel, near the Jezreel Valley, if you're familiar with the geography of that region of the world. And the approximate time in which this takes place. And the king who's speaking during this time um, is pro approximately 850 BC. So it's maybe a hundred years before our other prophet that we considered last week and the week before. You know, the rebellious prophet Jonah. Well, a hundred years before Jonah, here is this uh, story taking place in this event in the northern kingdom also. And look what it, it, it talks about. Elisha. His name means God is my salvation. Speaking about uh, who is God. God is my salvation. And he was a prophet who traveled among the people of God. Remember, he was a protege to who? Elijah. And he followed Elijah and he learned the ways of the Lord from Elijah. And God blessed Elisha with a double blessing, and that's evident in his life. As great as Elijah was, Elisha was blessed with a double blessing. And he performed 
twice as many miracles as it's recorded as Elijah did. Did a, 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 a lie, a lie shot. So we see that he was, he was kind of revealing the care of the Lord as he walked in words of wisdom and through miracles. And this is an example here in this passage we're introduced in the opening verse. Look what he says. Um, first it says, Elisha said to the woman, the Shunammite woman, this is the miracle. His, he raised her son from the dead. He restored his, her son to life. And also he offers words of wisdom. What does he say? Go away with your family and stay for a while. Because there's a famine coming in the land. And it's going to last seven years. Wow. Those are strong words of wisdom. Real counsel. Now, this shows us that God cares for his own, as demonstrated, demonstrated through this prophet, Elisha, whose name means God is my salvation. And so uh, this famine in the land, you see, usually famines, why did they occur, especially in the land, it appears as though it's just a localized famine because he gives counsel, go somewhere else where this famine isn't occurring. Usually famines in the land of Israel were a consequence for what? A punishment for disobedience or apostasy. In Romans chapter 28, talking about the blessings over the nation of Israel if they obey. And so the first several verses talk about that. God will bless them and God will prosper them and provide for them and they will be protected in the land. But if they disobey, the, the consequences are that they will suffer much. And one such example is a famine in verses 38 to 40 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says, you will sow much seed in the field, but you'll not harvest it because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine and gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the olive because the olives will not drop. And so this was a consequence. There was disobedience amongst the people, and yet it's important to know that God singles out his own. This woman here. We don't know that much about her up to this point, the Shunammite woman, but certainly um, he has a plan for her to bless her and to protect her, to care for her. But look at the woman's response is what's important. What does he do? What the, excuse me, what does she do? She accepts Elisha's advice and follows his directions. Now let's consider this advice is given before, we can assume, the famine begins. So, and she was a woman of plenty, as it says in chapter 4, when we're introduced to this Shunammite woman in 2 Kings in chapter 4. It says that she was well-to-do in verse 8 of chapter 4. So she was well-off, she was prosperous. And Elisha comes along and says, leave your land, leave your home, and go somewhere else. And all that she had, all that she possessed, we're not sure how long of a period of time it took for us to hear this word, this word of counsel and advice, to react to it, but we can assume quite quickly. And she left it all behind. And certainly from the rest of the passage, that's what she did. This, and where did she go? To the land of the Philistines. Now, she wasn't specifically counseled to go there. But he said, go, any, go, go somewhere else. And she left. She simply acted in faith towards God's watch and care over her. It was a demonstration of real faith to leave that behind not knowing where she's going, and understanding that she was going to the land of the Philistines, 
For the most part, the Philistines were a wicked people. They were oftentimes the enemies of Israel. And she's going into that land for an extended period of time. She has nothing but faith to carry her through. As Who was it that said, uh, I believe it was Spurgeon that said, I have a nickel in my pocket, but the promises of God. And so that's all really she was leaving with and going on. I wonder how you and I would have responded to hear that. She knew Elisha was the man of God, a man of God from chapter 4 when we're introduced to Elisha in ministering to her or her ministering to Elisha as well. That's the background information, chapter 4, to understand how this relationship began. But she knew that he was a man of God, and therefore she could he not only hear, but heed that counsel. How quickly would we be willing to do that? Really, uh, it reminds us that even the things of this earth that we possess, and how, how do we possess them? How do we hold them? Or do we cling to these things and we're not willing to let go of these things? This is a reminder also, if I can make another observation, that God doesn't say, I'm going to protect you in the land. You have to leave. There are some things that the believer experiences this side of heaven. We're not immune from the suffering and sorrow and the tragedies of this life. And we're reminded time and time again that this world is not our home. And so the observation here is there's another place that for the meanwhile, for the meantime, is a better place. Are you willing to let go of these things? Can you think of a better place that you and I have in the promises of God that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many rooms or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. That if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. Are, do we really live that out? So when the time comes that God calls us, we're ready. This place is not our home. We're reminded of that every day. And so if our hope is in this world and everyone getting along and there be no pain and sorrow, our faith is misplaced and we're misguided. And so this teaches us that God cares for his own. It doesn't say that Elisha went to everybody. In fact, most of the people were undoubtedly in disobedience, in a place of apostasy. They would not heed that message anyways, but certainly God comes to his own. And so Elisha said to the woman, son he had restored to life. You read about that restoration to life in chapter 4. And so um, it must have been, you see, it wasn't only about he cares for his own. This woman acted in faith, but she was faithful. Eh? She was faithful. Verses 1 through 3 tell us that she was in the land until the seven years were over. <laughs> in Philist. Philistine country, you know, Goliath of Gath, that's Philistine country. All that uh, these evil uh, people uh, stood for, she was in that region. I wonder how much perseverance was required. Sometimes faith requires faithfulness in persevering. We don't know the end of, yes, we read through verse 6. We're only talking about her in verses 1 through 3. She doesn't know what it's going to be like in Philistine country. It's not the land flowing uh, with milk and honey, so to speak, and God's blessing normally on that region of the world. But yet she's going there <laughs> with how much she's going with her family. 
That's what it says. Those who are nearest and dearest to her, and that's it. Leaving everything behind. She was she exercised faith and faithfulness because she believed God cares for her. But that's not all about God's care. What else do we learn about God's care? God's care is not only uh, to his own, but God's care is what? It's long term. And it's timely. While this is going on, uh, of course, she comes back to the, uh, she returns to the land after seven years of living somewhere else in Philistine country. She returns. And she wants her home and her land back. That's a, fi a fair uh, desire to have. Look what it says. And she went back, she, at the end of the seven years, in verse 3, she came back to the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. Why is she appealing to the king? I don't know, it doesn't say that he left, uh, in the first three verses, that she left the land to him. Perhaps, uh, you know, some say it was a family member or a stranger that just came along and occupied it, you know. But probably it was a crown. It was the crown that possessed this land from her. And what would, can you imagine also that she, it doesn't mention her husband. It says in chapter 4 that her husband was old. In fact, the child that was born to her is nothing short of a miracle because she was childless. And uh, in fact, Elisha prophesied to her that the next year, at this time, back in chapter 4, you are going to have a child. You're going to be carrying a child in your arms. And so um, this is the child that died a few years later that Elisha restored to life. All in chapter 4, you could read about that. And so um, she, you can just imagine though, again, I wonder how she felt going, approaching the king, can I have my property back? My home back? What's her chances of the king saying, sure. Oh, who is the king? Gerald. Who's Gerald? He's, a, he's in, look, in verse, uh, in chapter 8, in verse 16, it says, or excuse me, Joram. In the fifth year of Joram, son of, he's the son of Ahab, who was the king of Israel, uh, when Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, Jerome, son of Jehoshaphat, began his reign um, in the king of Judah. And so look, uh, look at him in verse 18. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for he married the daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Basically, that's what I'm coming to. This is the kind of king that she's approaching. Assuming that her husband is no longer with her, she has to make this request on her own. God cares for his own, and it's long-term. And because it's long-term, she hasn't forgotten about the Lord and how he protected her in Philistine country. So she has the courage of her convictions to say, that belongs to me. What's the king going to do under nor normal circumstances? King's going to say, no way, no how. Sorry, what are you going to do about it? But you see, there's something else we need to consider. God works in miraculous ways. The, the, the timing of the Lord is perfect. And we read that here, you see, because faith sees beyond the hurdles to apprehend the promises of God. There were many hurdles. She was maybe a, a single woman, a, a mom. Uh, no one, not much to protect her. Look, few provisions, we would assume. And she's approaching the king. <laughs> but she has faith. Faith and courage. And there's, because you see, there's something else going on here, unbeknownst to her. At that very time that she approaches the king, what does it say is going on? Gehazi! 
So we've got, wow, we've got some neat, we've got Joram, the king. We've got the Shunammite woman. We've got Gehazi. Who's Gehazi? Gehazi is a servant of Elisha. You see, in the first few verses, we read about Elisha warning this woman to get out of Dodge. But we don't read about Elisha here. Elisha is not part of uh, this conversation going on. But the Lord has brought Gehazi into close proximity to the king. And in fact, the king is saying, tell me about this Elisha. You see, all that's gone on, Elisha's reputation has preceded him as a servant of God. And Joram, though he's an evil king, there must have been some curiosity. You know, tell me about this. We just had a seven-year famine. He had prophesied about it. Perhaps the king got wind of that, and now it's over. I want to know about him. And so Gehazi, oh yes, Gehazi's there mentioned in chapter 4 too. He witnessed what? He witnessed the son of this woman who had died and been brought back to life. So what better way is there to talk about Elisha and how special he is and how he's a servant of the Most High God than to give the greatest miracle of all? Yes, he told the king about uh, the uh, Elisha's son, who he restored, uh, or excuse me, the, the woman's son, the Shunammite woman's uh, son, who Elisha had restored to life. And so, all of this conversation is going on. What happens? Who's that? It's the Shunammite woman. She, at this point, is now requesting that the king give her Return to her, her home and property. What a fluke, eh? Just crazy. Just luck. Just a chance meeting. You see, when God, when God reveals that he cares, it's amazing how providence works through all of this. God's sovereignty at just that moment. And, the, and so the, the king looks to the woman, and of course Gehazi says, there's the woman. I'm telling you about. And there's her son. You know that there needed to be, for um, something to be found true in a court of law, there needed to be two or three witnesses. And we got them. Gehazi, the woman, and the son. They're all going to say the same thing. They're going to corroborate the story. The king says, is that true? Yep. My son, uh, the, my son was brought back from the dead because of Elisha. The, the, you, you can imagine the king, he must have made, perhaps it's not stated here, but there must have been more than one question. He must have been probing. What is going on? Tell me about it. Give testimony to what's going on. And you see, God cares about our witness. This is the next point. God's sovereignty, he brought this, he brought this, this event together. God is working in our lives. We don't necessarily see. Once in a while, we see, we might kind of, or usually we see things in hindsight. Oh, the Lord must have been working in that. Yeah, the Lord must have been. But we can see, we can trust when God cares that there's providence happening. Things are going on at this moment in the lives of God's people, that he is bringing things together and working things out for his purpose. And so what does the, the king ask the woman? Tell me about it. And you see, what's, important, what's interesting, this is a, a testimony. God cares about our witness. This is a tell-tale told event. You know, we sing the song, tell me the old, old story. So this woman's going to tell. Look at verse 4. It starts in verse 4. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and, ha and had said, tell me. The king wants to know. Verse 5, just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life. Now verse 6. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. This is a telltale told story. You see, that's what, 
That's what's so precious about the Lord, is that he wants to bring this out. Tell, tell, tell. Tell me about the one that was raised from the dead. Do you think we have a greater story to tell about somebody who was raised from the dead that God brings into our path? Is that true? We don't know about this king, what his motivation is at this point. It doesn't seem to be conviction. It's about curiosity, at least. He wants to know, is it true? By the... <laughs> Divine, divine design, the Lord brings us in the place where people will say, is it true? Tell me, what about this Son of God, Jesus Christ? Did he really rise from the grave? If he didn't rise from the grave, then we are wasting our time. You see, this woman knew personally, yes, I saw it. He's my son. He rose from the grave. It was experiential. Even as we had this prayer request mentioned about the one who we're praying for that kind of understands, but not completely. It's not personal. Not personally understanding. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He bore your sins in his own body, but he's not dead and in the grave. He rose from the grave up from the grave and he rose to the higher highest heavens and he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. This is a, a, a wonderful message, a wonderful gospel message. It's amazing how we see Christ even in a, a, a book called Second Kings in chapter 8 it's about the dead rising from the grave, the sun. And so the Shunammite woman, you see, one observation is there might be those, even here, who have heard the gospel. And they understand it, the death, they've heard about the death and the resurrection. And they've also perhaps even exercised kindness toward God's people. Some people are like that. They'll just, they respect Christians and they'll, bless Christians, and they'll be curious about uh, what God has done, but they're lost because they haven't trusted Christ as their Savior. And certainly, God wants us to tell that message. He, God cares about our witness. It's important. That's what one important reason why he has us here, that we might declare his riches and his glory and his grace. And finally, he cares about our works. He cares about our works. If I can just read uh, this passage of scripture from Galatians and chapter um, 6. What does it say here? Be not... Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit, he will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially those who belong to the family of believers. This is really a, a story about a woman receiving in this life the blessings of God because in chapter 4, she had blessed Elisha. She had blessed Elisha because in chapter 4, it tells us how she met him. And she perceived that he was a man of God. So she told her husband, every time he comes through, we're going to feed him a meal. And you know what? In fact, in chapter 4, it says that we are going to build on to our home. So that whenever he passes through, not only can he have a, a, a square meal, but he has a place to stay. And here we are in chapter 8. She's getting her home and her property back. 
And not only that, what does it say? She received back, give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. It was probably, undoubtedly, it was a, it was a prosperous land. It produced fruit, and they sold the fruit, and they lined their pockets, and the king said, give it back to her. Every cent that you've made off of that land, from the time she left, seven years worth of wages, she, got, she received back along with her land and property. You know, God is not blind. God sees our works, and he cares about our works. It's the sowing and reaping principle. He will bless our lives one way or another as we give to him in serving him, in providing and blessing God's people specifically and being a blessing to those around us. And so we can be reminded, us, let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because your labor in the Lord, not in vain. And so in this wonderful little passage of six verses, so much we can learn about God, God's loving care, his watch care over our lives. Be encouraged with that in a world that is ever shifting and moving and unpredictable and all these things going on and we're informed every day. Let us be reminded of the, the Lord's watch care over our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your watch care over our lives. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross, rose from the grave. And we thank you that we, we serve a risen Savior. Help us to be mindful of your presence in our lives. Lord, when we can't see the future and we seem to be in such unpredictable times, you are sovereign. You are providentially overseeing in all the issues of life that we can, we can trust in your loving care and that we would continue to live by faith, perhaps even more faith. And we pray for those for this morning that maybe have not made a personal decision to trust, to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would confess their sin and call upon Jesus Christ to save them. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name I pray.